It's always an adventure. Yes, dreaming is always an adventure. And we have started now and we are in the first edition of Women Matters of 2019. And we are a new crew, a new <laughs> set of people, some old people, some new people. And uh, so before we start to go into the topic, which today would be resilience, exploring resilience, I would like everybody to uh, uh, present, you don't say present themselves, introduce themselves and where you are, what you are up to and what is uh, inspiring you to be here with me on this broadcast. I'm Heidi Hörnlein. I'm the founder of the Wisdom Factory and I also the founder of the nonprofit ParadisoIntegrale.com in Italy. And I love to talk with people and to expand my knowledge and awareness. And that's why I created these circles. This one in English, another one in German, and especially to talk with women. So, so far with me. <laughs> Who wants to go next? Heidi, I can only see you. Am I supposed to see everyone? You, you can if you, I think if you go to the upper, upper uh, right hand part of your screen, there's one thing that says speaker view and another thing that says gallery. If you see gallery, click on that. I see participants. Uh, no, stop video mute more let me see no, top top left oh top. or top right and she right. has an ipad so it's different maybe oh, oh gallery view yeah i see i see six of us including Yay, me. good and you are dorothy and you are coming to us from america tell us a little bit about you well, I'm Dorothy Stern Kucha. I live on the Oregon coast. I'm looking out at the Pacific Ocean right now, which is blue. And um, this is a somewhat isolated place to live. And I lack for um, conversations that are engaging and expanding. And when I complained to Victoria, she said, well, I know just the place. Um, I'm interested in many things. I'm a therapist. I still work with some clients. Um, I just sent out a New York Times uh, wonderful article by another therapist about uh, women in their 70s and resilience was a huge piece of it. So um, it's, it's very nice to be here and um, I'm looking forward to seeing what unfolds. I'm Tammy. Oh, yes. Moni, you've got, uh, uh, got sound. I'm glad you can hear me. Uh, my camera doesn't work, so at least I can listen in and listen to what you say. Okay? You can join, you can speak. Yes, I can speak as well, yeah. <laughs> Just frustrated again by mm -hmm. technology. Okay. But I'm glad I finally got one system working. Okay, so, so uh, I'm, I'm Monia, I live in Vienna, Austria, and I'm very interested in resilience. And yeah, I'm glad that we have some new participants, Dorothy, and Elizabeth is also here, great. Hannah, Tammy, it's just fantastic. <laughs> glad to be here. My name is Tammy. I'm in uh, what's known as Vancouver on the unceded Coast Salish territories um, in what's known as Canada. And I am, uh, I'm really grateful to be a part of meaningful conversations where we are able to reach our wisdom and, uh, and, and talk about what really matters. Um, and yeah, and I, I love being a part of a, a group of women who, uh, who can access our wisdom together because I think that's where we can really um, go deep and, uh, and explore kind of the unknown, which is, for me, I think that there's a, a, um, a lot of wisdom that just exists that we need to be able to access and share together. So that's why I'm here.
Hey, I'm, I'm Elizabeth Diebold. I'm American, as you can tell by my accent, but I live in Frankfurt, Germany. And uh, my, uh, my life has been committed to gender development and particularly with women. Um, but lately my, my passion has been the, uh, the intersubjective we, um, the power of, of we, uh, uh, the, the, the awakening of the consciousness between us, because I think that that has radical implications for transforming how we think about ourselves as women and as men and, as, and being human beings together. Um, and I'm the founder of One World in Dialogue uh, and am part of the organization Emerge Bewusstseins Kultur in here in Germany. And I was very honored to be asked to join the conversation by Heidi and um, am very curious what will unfold here between us. Yeah, I am Hannah. I am in North Germany in a small village, a tiny house in Northern Germany. Uh, I've been invited by Moni and I've known Moni and Heidi for about 10 years now in the Integra movement and particularly in the uh, um, Women Integra Consciousness Wib Bewusstsein in German and uh, those were the starts so for me uh, I practice many many years Tibetan Buddhism in Scotland and I met Integral in 95, Ken, I started reading Ken Wilber in 95, so that for me is uh, opened a whole new world and, and, and made it more possible to include a lot of other, other realms, other aspects, other perspectives, uh, while I still follow my spiritual path and, and also work in that direction. Yeah, so, uh, so for me always, uh, I've never been a feminist when it in excluded men because I love men. But I also don't like living in a world that is just uh, masculine in a sense. Uh, even I think men suffer if the world is too masculine, too one-sided, too lopsided. So, so I love having here, I've, I've known Elizabeth also for a long time. So, and, and Victoria, not only recently, but uh, who knows, in this life, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, I'm really very, very happy to be here in, in this group of uh, mature and, and, and evolutionary women. I don't know anything about resilience. Uh, well, I think I do, but I, I don't know the word that much. I haven't read or thought about it, but I think I am quite resilient. <laughs> so, we'll see. Um, hello, I'm Victoria Duda. Wow, it's so exciting to be here tonight because I feel like it's a meeting of roads I met Hannah at the Integral Conference in, when was it, in May, and she introduced me to Heidi, and it was such a wonderful event because lately I'm on a kind of development that I thought I was very alone with. You know, I used to live near London in England, and I used to have a lot of social life and a great professional life going on, and then I just finally felt that calling to leave that all behind and come here to northern Hungary, where I'm originally from, and uh, move into a little cottage at the ed edge of a, a forest, which, which felt like such a lone move. And then when I went to the Integral Conference, it uh, turned out that I'm actually part of a huge community that's doing that. <laughs> Suddenly, there were so many people who were on a little forest path somewhere, and then we started networking, and it turned out this is this is huge. So I feel much more connected, actually, that I'm here than when I was in that big city. Uh, so it's a fantastically exciting time for this technology to to allow us to to be where we are meant to be, and then still making the connections that are worldwide. That's why I find it so exciting that Dorothy came into the group because Dorothy is one of my all-time favorite wise women. 
and we met I think long long time ago wasn't it maybe over 10 years at least Mexico. sorry at least 15 years at ago. least 15 yes um, and but we are also connected even though we are on the other side of the world now so very happy to to be part of it thank you hey I think we have introduced ourselves everyone so we can now talk about oh Gertrude is coming too so you just got the present presentation introduction an English speaking woman told me you cannot say present yourself you have to say introduce yourself so please Gertrude introduce yourself yeah hi I'm Gertrude Weeks I'm um, living in Germany in the middle Frankfurt, north of Frankfurt, and I'm currently at my daughter's in uh, Austria, and so I had some technical difference, uh, difficulties in coming in. Um, I'm a coach, a trainer, and my topic is appreciation. Mm. So, and I'm, I just came from a, a wonderful seminar where we uh, worked with something we created the a model and that was a really wonderful experience and also with a company where the leader really wants us to do the work so i'm here sorry for being late and listen what you have to say and then i that's okay. Myself. Thank you, Gertraud. And I want to tell everybody tomorrow I have with Gertraud a Wisdom Factory event in German about mm -hmm. her work and about the book she has co authored. So if you want to know what she is doing, and I think almost everybody of you, except Tammy, knows a little bit of German, mm -hmm. uh, you can come in. We would be happy to see you. So the And it's great to see you all. <laughs> And some new faces, and uh, it's January, so I still can wish everybody a wonderful year. Mm -hmm. So resilience, and I'm resilient because I have all these tech things, uh, and uh, yeah, that's not as I would like to. Anyway, uh, I on, so on, only a few years ago, I didn't even know what it meant. And then I slowly got to understand that this means something that you can uh, face the life better with all the time, without all the time being overwhelmed by your own emotions. And when I read these books of um, uh, Harari, which, by the way, Moni, uh, Monia has uh, suggested to me that the last chapter was resilience, but it was not in the sense which I think we will talk today about, but it made very clear the future will be that we need resilience because it will be quite different than we are uh, used to, to live. And so in the um, website, Monia has uh, put in a, a paper, translated a paper uh, about resilience and, but before we go into that, I would like to ask everybody of you, what do you think it is and what does it mean for you up to what point you think you are resilient i have to say i don't think i'm very much resilient just you know so so but uh and then we go can go in this uh moments or in these qu um, qualities which can create us as a resilient human beings who wants to start? I would like to start because right now I'm at <laughs> the first one, acceptance, accept what has happened, observe the change, the chance for change. You need the ability to let go, disengage in order to be able to accept. So you can see me and I, my camera doesn't work, so I accept that. And um, my optimism is... <laughs> 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 that crisis are temporary and can be overcome. Confidence is required that things will improve. So maybe I just look for a new camera mm -hmm. or a new computer because this one is rather old and obviously there is not quite the, it doesn't work as it should. But you could see me just 
before. 15 minutes ago and then it was gone. So I really don't know what, what happened. Yeah, but it can be the computer, so it might <laughs> yeah. be a good idea too. So, so what do you think what resilience means for you? In your well, the, right now it means the awareness of my assets, resources and abilities. Um, so to find a solution, because I've gone through this technical problems before and I managed to solve them and it's not the end of the world and I take <laughs> point four I take responsibility for my own actions <laughs> um, yeah that's about where I'm right now with regard to resilience and to be solution oriented uh, as I said maybe I get a new computer who cares <laughs> Okay. So you have already used these uh, yeah, yeah, points yeah. of the text to describe your state. I, I have printed them and I have them pu put them next to me and I'm glad I did that because otherwise I would be just mad right now. I thought we will go through it uh, when everybody mm -hmm. has out of their belly uh, said what they think, okay. what their experience okay. is. Okay. okay? Well, I have a, a personal um, guru, uh, my daughter-in-law, <laughs> who has taught me in the last 10 years about resilience. Um, as I manage the relationship, uh, and it goes, the pendulum swings swiftly between difficulty and, and ease. Um, what I've learned about resilience is um, to stay grounded to stay centered uh, in my own self and to come into the present moment as often as I can so as the chaos of the changes um, doesn't totally knock me off my perch and um, to keep going to not despair or give up but to um, become more fluid in making that uh, transition back and forth and to always know that it'll keep changing and only by my reaction by my response <laughs> not reaction that's what i'm working on not being so reactive but by garnering a response that is much more mature and kind and um, spacious and so I've, I've had a big dose of resilience training uh, the last 10 years. Before that, when I worked with people, I was interested in how many of them were resilient enough to survive very difficult paths and others were totally crushed. And so I read a book called Playing a Bad Hand Well. And in that, resilience has another um, perspective. And at some point I can share that too. But the part that was the most important in that is that a child who has a very, very hard past needs at least one person to believe in them and um, give them strength and love and be present for them. And then they're really able to find their strengths. That's all. Mm -hmm. You go ahead yourself. I don't want to distribute the voices, you know. Maybe I'll carry on. Uh, yeah, I haven't read, uh, as I said, I haven't read much about it, but for me, resilience, uh, well, first of all, I want to disagree with you, Heidi. I, I think you have shown recently a lot of resilience having lost Mark and, and what you did with that and, and how you shared with all of us. And uh, it was just, just amazing how, how in a way you've, uh, through this tremendous grief and, and what would be caused 10 times over to, to just uh, crawl into a hole somewhere and hide. And instead you're just, your wisdom factory is just blossoming and it's, it's just, very very moving very very encouraging to see so uh, 
Thank you, but you don't see me in my bad mu moments, so. <laughs> well, no, I can imagine that. I think that's what resilience means, is that, uh, that you feel the grief and you are aware that this situation is actually overwhelming, but that giving up is just no option. You know, this, you know, this just, uh, geht nicht, gibt's nicht, we say in German. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, uh, you can't, you know, it's not possible not to, not to carry on. Uh, so you just carry on anyway. And, and yeah, I feel it's this, uh, um, so it would be interesting to see where's the source of resilience. Why, why do some people have, have more of it? have so much more even if faced with uh, tremendous difficulties i mean i my tibetan teachers they have escaped from tibet and and uh, spent six months uh, uh, crossing the himalayas and almost starving and losing a lot of their friends to to frost and starvation and they have reason they would have reason enough to be traumatized also before what they saw in the cultural revolution and and there's such uh, amazing people wise and loving and and relaxed and, and 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 sometimes i feel that people through who have like cancer or or who have go through incredible difficulties sometimes they're more resilient and more compassionate than than people who always have it easy you know they they hurt their little toe and 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 go to the doctor and don't know what to do you know and so so i think uh, 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 a certain amount of suffering uh, uh, maybe builds this this ability to uh, to cope or to find a solution uh, if if you always if everything if your parents have always given you everything and if you've always relied on other people to solve your problems then uh, then i think you will probably lack resilience yes. but at the same time if you're totally if you have no nobody caring like dorothy was saying a, a traumatized child needs at least one person they can rely on to rebuild their their trust in life so 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 i suppose it's a balance like with everything yeah yeah so that's that's some of the thoughts i have when i think of the world I'll jump in. Uh, for me, resilience is about uh, is about um, meeting the present moment anew and having the being resourced, being self resourced, and having the capacity to meet the present moment wherever I am and. I'm going to leave it there. Yeah, for me, that's what it is. I can, I can uh, jump in here. I mean, I think uh, I, I, there's a, a lot around resilience. I mean, resilience was a very pop topic in psychology in the 90s and, um, and there are ways in which in which actually just the thing that you said Dorothy about if you have one connection with uh, with with one person who sees you you know who recognizes your humanity your your gifts your just your humanness um, through whatever it is that you've been through that I mean that means so much that's a foundation that kind of being born witness to and supported um, is profound um, and then it, it started a whole spate of programs where they just tried to take random adults and stick them with poor children and say okay now you've got your caring adult and it doesn't work that way you know in, in fact it could be even, <laughs> even kind of horrible um, so that's one thing about resilience and I think Hannah I, I kind of agree with you where's the source of this what is this because if we're thinking about Harari in the context that Harari sets forth in all of his books, which is usually like hair-raisingly, frighteningly pessimistic, um, it's like, 
who would we be if, if the systems of meaning that are around us and the, the ways that we make a living and so forth were all like pff, collapsed? <laughs> you know, what would, what, what, who would, where would we find the courage, the strength to live, to, 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 to create ourselves completely anew, to be human with other, other human beings, to not, not become, um, selfish and uh and 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 overwhelmed by fear and pull away from other human beings um and i think whatever that is is the essence of resilience and i think that that's i think it's about the life force and about and and i think it's a mystery i think it's a real mystery to to all of us I mean, I, I know, I know I'm an unbelievable problem solver and, you know, I go into problem solving mode, you know, super fast. Um, but in facing something that is, that is, uh, profoundly, uh, shattering, that kind of problem solving is often not the best thing to jump into, but, but, you know, can we, how, how can we reinforce or, 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 or make it possible to access the, 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 the will to life, the, the love of life that allows us to, to, to meet things that, that might be incredibly devastating. Um, to me, that's, that's what re resilience is about. And I, I, I often in myself find it as a surprise. <laughs> rather than as something that I can, I can build up or, you know, cultivate. Uh, I think there are ways of cultivating it, but I think that that's, that's a, that's a deep, deep and very transformative spiritual practice rather than like 10 things to do today to get more resilience, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, it's like, how, 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 how open am I to the force of life itself? that allows that whatever hits me doesn't, doesn't take me down because that force is, is, is stronger than my own mind, is stronger than my own self image, is stronger than my own expectations about what should be. Um, to me, that's, that's the essence of, of resilience. I really liked what you said about the mystery. Um, it really resonates because I work with uh, past lives. I'm a hypnotherapist and I do these past life regressions. And that was always a very big question to me. You know, why is someone resilient? Why is someone maybe having the worst kind of childhood where they are abused and they suffer through hell, but then they still become maybe a great teacher, or a great therapist? And another child is put in a similar situation and they just become a drug addict and they end up under the bridge. So what's the difference? So obviously, this is one of the huge questions. And I was interested whether there is something in the people, something in their karmic past or inside. Is there a story? Is there some sort of resource that would answer to that question? And I don't know the final answer at all, but it has to do something with that mystery. So I've been observing that there are people who hold memories inside of them, whether, and whether there is, that's an archetypal imprint or a past life memory, I don't know, but whatever, they have something inside of them that is a memory of a higher level. And it's a contradiction, isn't it? Because they have a memory, but they have a memory almost of the future. It's like they have a memory of, of a vision so if I have to use a metaphor, I would be thinking like, if we are the fish who are meant to evolve out of the water and turn into tadpoles or whatever is the next stage, and then those tadpoles are going to eventually go out on the, on the land and they are going to become frogs or whatever, and they are going to start a new and a higher level of existence, then I think that the type of fish who have seen 
others coming out or they have glimpsed a life outside of the water, they are going to be so driven by that vision that they are going to be much more resilient. And I think that explains why, like Dorothy said, if there's one caring adult, but it's perhaps a, an adult who's carrying that vision, is a type of person maybe that child wants to grow into or, or wants to be like or wants to follow, then that's a glimpse. And then that glimpse helps them to overcome the odds. But if they haven't seen that, then it's a lot more difficult. So I've observed that it's either the encounter with a person, like a wise person, a more evolved person that they have encountered, or it's encountering that life force energy that you also mentioned, didn't you? That someone got in touch with in, in a situation where they experienced the life force energy on their body, or they just had a spiritual awareness even if it was just for a minute, but that really showed them beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is a higher reality. I think if you see that once for a second, then there's no turning back. It's kind of like the mystical turning point. And from that moment when I think become, people become much more resilient. That's my current take on things, but it's a work in progress. There many things I can resonate with what you said. Um, and, and I was, um, just came to my memory um, when I was working in the midwife school. They, they said that uh, babies that had a very smooth pregnancy and then all of a sudden something happens and they come to, to earth like eighth or ninth month, uh, eighth month. And, and they are shocked and they have very hard time to adjust. But if there were several things during the pregnancy that didn't work well and, and the mother had to lie down or uh, something, I don't know, um, had to overcome challenges then those kids are a lot more resilient even if they are pre-born a premature born um, and I thought this is like like uh, Hannah said so the challenges in life um, not everybody can do that but that many challenges help us to become the one that we are in a more resilient way than if everything was just smooth. And I was thinking of Saluto Genesis, um, Antonovsky, who said that, that we need three things to, to be resilient. He, he worked with um, survivors of the Holocaust and there were some people that were just um, healthy <laughs> going through all this and others completely destroyed and and sick uh, premature death and, and all and then he asked most people suffered so much that they became sick but there were just a few and what made them healthy what what let them stay healthy and he came up with they had some kind of an understanding what's going on they had the they tried to have at least a little bit to uh, where they they could handle it, like uh, creating some kind of singing groups or something where they had the say in, though the whole thing they didn't, but just to have a little thing where they th thought they, they, they were self-empowered. And the last thing was, or the third thing was to be... Uh, that there is something beyond. So 
there is some sense, some purpose beyond my humble being. And that resonates with the mystery. And, and so they had to have all three in place to overcome those atrocious um, circumstances. So if one was missing, they didn't have much chance to, to survive healthy. But all three together, that, that makes the difference. That's what he said and that reminded me. So, and um, talking about heart math, the heart math institute, they say we have 5,000 times more electromagnetic power in our heart than in our brains. And so if we try to solve problems with our brains and working against the heart, it doesn't work. But if that is in coherence, then I think resilience kicks in. And that is not possible without being present. Um, I have the impression that we are talking about different levels of experience that need resilience. Like when I just managed the camera, that's completely different than people who really are traumatized and have face uh, this, uh, extinction. Uh, and I guess this is the, the level where uh, a higher consciousness kicks in. Um, so those of us who have, the, have had these mystical experiences are somehow privileged. So when they are not resilient, I think it's an offense to the universe. Uh, this idea just came. I, never, I haven't had it before, but it just emerged. <laughs> okay, this is what I, what Gertra just triggered in me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So, the, Gertra uh, was talking about meaning. When we find a meaning in life, whatever it is. Uh, Victor Frankl said, where the meaning, uh, everything can be overcome. Um, and then coming back to Harari, which seems to be so much in the rational or deconstructive uh, mindset and doesn't allow any um, mystical stories and uh, no stories at all. So all after the previous life thing would all be story. So two questions I have. One, uh, how is it connected resilience with our personality type? And so my, some people are just more resilient, you know, uh, because they are less uh, neurotic, less emotionally, um, uh, how do you say, touchable than others. And the other is, how do we create meaning in our lives, even if we know that everything is relative, and how do we then believe into that, and how can we so strengthen this idea of resilience? You said having the mystical experiences. Uh, Tammy, with your mushroom trips, I have never done that, but I can imagine that uh, this can lead to something like that, that you have a different vision of of other realities, a clear experience, not only, I had a so short vision, but not really an experience of that. So what do you think is causing resilience in us and what could we do to, to increase it a little bit and to find meaning in, a, in the surrounding which seems to be without meaning <laughs> or against meaning or deconstructive? I just, uh, Timmy, did you want to say first? Okay. Um, I just jump in. I, I just came to me. I, I thought it's about body, mind, and soul. It's not just 
having this mystical experience doesn't help you in everyday life challenges and um so these three like some kind of understanding um some kind of empowerment and and having so i can do that <laughs> and some kind of mystic whatever you call it some kind of purpose beyond <laughs> um so if body mind and soul come together and are in coherence then it's a lot easier to deal with situations on any level that's what just came to my mind um dorothy you're muted i didn't do anything okay you're you're unmuted i'm I'm sorry, I did mute you in the middle when your phone rang just because we could hear all that. So I'm um, just, uh, I'll, I'll try and monitor that. Am I back on? Okay. Um, whoa, let's, <laughs> being muted sort of, I, I have to be resilient now and come back. Um, sometimes I think resilience um, is actually in the DNA or somehow how that works in terms of our character structure. You know, I think that if you have the, pos I don't know if everyone has the potential for resilience or maybe they did at the very beginning, but it seems like the people who have written and Frankel and the people who analyzed why some people survived the camps and why some people perished the minute they saw the gate. Um, I, I, I know those people, they're part of my family, so, I saw the ones I saw who didn't find that resilience and um, others who it, it was there. And I'd like to think that it might be already a part of who we are and that if we're lucky enough to access the resilience and then build on it and grow on, grow with it, whether it be through, like Victoria said, you know, past life or future visions or creating metaphors sort of automatically. I, I have an ability um, to see an owl and, and create that as my spirit animal just when I need wisdom and just when I need to stay on my perch. So that seems like a tool. Those seem like tools that abilities, gifts that we have that nurture and uh, increase uh, a person's um, resilience. So I don't know if it's part of our physical, spiritual makeup, but I know that it's distinct when it's there and it's distinct when it's not. It also seems to me that um, coming back to Heidi's first question, that it's quite important to distinguish between like toughness and resilience. So what I mean by that, that you were mentioning people who are like very sensitive and very neurotic. I think I'm, for example, like that. I'm highly sensitive and I haven't been raised in a way that that was taken into consideration. So I ended up quite neurotic for quite a long time. But when I see it, that situation now, I think it actually made me more resilient. When I think of resilience, not as just like the ability to survive whatever comes in life, but also the ability to hold on to your own highest path. So if you're thinking, for example, of um, an artist whose life mission is to create something, then if they get rid of the sensitivity and then maybe they survive and maybe they become very successful in business or something like that, but they forgot their artistic sensitivity and they fail to create. And for me, that's not resilience. That's a type of failure. So it can be very useful to be sensitive and then somehow find a way to use that. It reminds me of martial arts. 
because one way I was uh, dealing with the hypersensitivity that I started to study martial arts and that's when I learned from, from the wise teachers, because of course in martial arts, there are the, the tough and the brutal and the violent ones who are uh, not really martial artists actually, but the, the wise ones who, who teach you to actually use that on a path to self-development and ultimately to a path to, to nonviolence, they teach that the, there is this, this Tai Chi move where you put your, your fist and your hand together like that. And the fist is symbolizing the, the strength, the strong, the tough, when you need that. And then the hand that is hugging it is symbolizing the softness and the sensitivity and the kindness. And like it, when the two together, when they work together, that's when a, a system is most resilient. Because if you're just too hard and you break like the strong wood in the wind, but you can then be softer like, like the palm tree that grows in the wind and then the two together form the resilient system. And I think that's something very important to keep in mind. It's not always the toughness that makes you more resilient, I think. Um, I was triggered by the, the word access to resilience. I think Dorothy mentioned that. So this is actually then a whole, uh, not just your characteristic or your toughness or your sensitivity, it's a set of tools you can make use of. And maybe it's psychic, it's in your psyche, uh, maybe it's in your body, or maybe it's in your spiritual. Uh, as Gertrude said, it's body, mind, and soul. So we don't, we are not always resilient. I guess rather just a couple of minutes ago, I was rather angry, but then I sort of, yeah, I don't know how I did it, but just to be ready to, ex to let go and to accept. This was what I did. I said, okay, so they won't see me and I can hear them at least. Um, and then something changes. I don't know what I did or which buttons I pressed, but something, I did something differently. And yeah, to me, this, uh, to me uh, resilience now becomes some kind of tool set to really uh, accept and be ready to use. I wonder if the be ready to use is the other part that we're talking, we've been talking about. Because you can have the tools, you can have the tools and, 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 and yet, if there's something in you that, that gets crushed at the gate, you're not gonna pick them up. Um, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna think either that you deserve it or you're just not gonna have the resource or the clarity of mind or the energy or um, to be able to, you know, to pick them up and use them. I think, I think that's part, I think that's, that's why I, I keep thinking how mysterious this is. You know, how is it that, that someone says, Oh, well, I can do this. You know, there's, there are these tools that I can use and someone else, you know, just can't, you know, can't move. Um, I mean, it's interesting. My, my mother's 90. She had a bad accident this summer and she's now living with my brother and it's, and it's having trouble. I mean, it's, it's difficult. Um, and one day I talked to her and she was very, you know, like she couldn't, everything was, you know, but I can't do that and I can't do this. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a problem solver, really, really sometimes really not helpful. And, she, and she's, you know, and she's like, well, you know, and then I called like two days later and some, something had, you know, kind of come to life. And she was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm practicing walking and I'm doing this. And I, and I was like, what, so what's the, what is it? What is, it? what is that? You know, I mean, she could have two days before done the same thing, but she wasn't there. Um, but some, some, some 
I mean, I, I've always said my mother's going to outlive me. <laughs> There's something in, in my mom that is like this incredible life force or this incredible resilience that, that no matter what happens, she may go down, you know, <laughs> kind of get, get knocked out even for a little while or yeah, teeter moops at the edge, but then it's like, no, I need to do this. And it's like, what is that? That's, it's just amazing. I mean, it is what makes the cosmos keep going. You know, it's, it's like that force is something that, that one has to like really respect because it's, it's quite extraordinary, but it's a mystery. And I want to add something, the resistance we often have, even if we have the tools and mm -hmm. we don't want to. So what is it make us change the mind, you know, that, that we can let go the resistance? And I think that that's one of the big parts is about um, um, yeah, really being Sorry, I, I, in fact, lost my thread as soon as I, uh, um, as soon as I took my It's frozen. Um. Maybe we can hear from her in a minute. No, she's back. She will be back. Hannah, if you want to jump in in the meantime, we haven't heard from you. My friend oh, has just been. lost her husband. Um, oh, Tammy, we didn't, Tammy, we didn't hear anything from you. Now she's gone completely. So, should we come? Oh, no, here you are. <laughs> can you start again? <laughs> So I'm, I'm at my friend's house and she's just lost her husband last, last week. And I've been able to witness incredible resilience. And um, yeah, it's, it's, for me, it's in seeing her, it's been like consistently meeting the moment with her presence. Uh, and she lives with a lot of gratitude and how I, I, I think that what I've seen and what I've been able to experience has been, has been just really showing up presently in the moment, asking for what she needs when she needs it and just meeting that moment. Um, and, and Heidi, I was thinking about how you led us into this. What is, what is the meaning? Right. And, and how does meaning and, and resilience interplay? And I think that that, um, you know, what Einstein said about, you know, is it, is it an unfriendly world or a friendly world? You know, and, and, and I think that that orientation to meaning making is one of the pieces that can allow, you know, what Elizabeth was just saying, you know, choosing to, uh, choosing to, um, either be able to, to respond or react. And I think that what I've been able to witness has been incredibly beautiful. Um, and it's, it's taught me a lot. I've been learning a lot about resilience this week. So I just wanted to share that. And I want to share that you lost your brother about a month ago or something like this and you were there with him and you have shown this resilience too. Yeah. Yeah, I was just just before that I was going to comment on Elizabeth saying about her mother because uh, I uh, uh, I was with my mother until she died last year uh, age 90 and we always called her Stehauffrauchen which is, yeah, do you know these, you know the Stehaufmännchen in, in German, Elizabeth? It's, it's these little dolls that have a, have a bow bottom and, and you push them down and they bounce back up. And if you hold them down long enough, then they bounce up back even harder. So 
So I think uh, at least the German women uh, or most European women who lived through one or even two world wars, they, they have had to show a lot of resilience with, with a lot of their husbands and, and fathers and sons being killed or, and killing others so, and, and just having to feed the family. And my mom always said, that actually it doesn't matter how rich you are or even if your bombs are falling all around you, it doesn't actually change the degree of happiness you can have. You can be incredibly happy and, and, and fulfilled in the middle of chaos and uh, just eating, uh, not even having enough to eat and you can live in, uh, uh, in uh, superfluous, you know, with too much material possessions, and actually could be quite unhappy. So, so she, that struck her very much when, and it moved me when when she told me that. And it was uh, something that left a deep impression on me. That uh, I think even as a little girl, when she told me that, I was trying to imagine what it's like when you're in the war and and and. Uh, or you don't have enough to eat, or you don't have enough to feed your children, which I think is even worse than not having enough to eat just yourself. And, and somehow to, to become uh, inventive, you know, just make do or just use something else, just do something else. And, and uh, I think that is also part, part of that. If maybe you've lived through different, you've lived through difficult times and then, then you have you're more able to use resources that otherwise you wouldn't even see, you wouldn't even think of. So, yeah, and, and Tammy, it's very moving what you just told us, that, that you're actually in the middle of a situation like that, observing it. I think we can probably observe uh, resilience and develop our compassion uh, and any time, if if we only look, if we only if we can bear to look around us, you know, and actually see see both see people suffering without it uh, breaking us, and also see people being happy. I mean, sometimes when you watch a group of alcoholics sitting in the road, you know, and they're they're cold and they're sick and they're, you know, but this. They sometimes they're so loving with each other, and they're so uh, they have a different type of cheerfulness, even you know, uh, um, than than the business people walking, you know, the the, the successful managers <laughs> walking stressed, and <laughs> who have millions maybe, you know, or have more money than they can actually spend. Hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, but certainly um, being in with several generations like children, I think it's very, very important that children also spend time with their grandparents if they're always older people, if they don't have them and actually take part in the, even in the aging process and help, help their older, you know, people rather than institutionalizing everything. And that, that, the dying process takes place at home, or at least in a, in a good hospice where you can be with your with your loved ones and accompany them, because that's that's just such an incredible challenge and also a, a gift. I think that's where we can learn resilience. Also, we we can learn, you know, when when we see. I mean, when I saw how my mom really learned from every disability, everything that she found, you know, from age 75, she said it started and, and she lived, still lived 20, uh, 15 years, 25, yeah, 15 years from that. And then, then she said, it starts that there's something you can't do anymore and you know you'll never be able to do it. You know, and, and then to accept that and then to do it another way when she couldn't, uh, uh, she she had to hold onto the rail to move upstairs, and she was always when she lived alone before I moved in. Uh, then and she wanted to eat upstairs because it was nice. The kitchen was downstairs, and she wanted to eat upstairs, so she carried a basket, and you know, so, so she could have, she carried her cutlery in the basket. And then when when that became too heavy, 
and she had to use two rails, uh, then she had a shoulder back. <laughs> You know, just to be in, in, inventive and invent some other way to cope and to to stay uh, independent also, to stay self self-sufficient. I think that's a big part of it. Being resilient, I think, is a lot to do with uh, solve, somehow being able to take care of yourself and solve problems yourself. Yeah. Well, I find that I would say almost a typical women's conversation. We are so much down to earth and to the practical and to what we really do and how life is and observing life. And when I remember having read this book, he is a philosopher, you know, seeing the things from somewhere. And he is even negating that there is something like mystics and like uh, like soul, there's no soul, you know, there's all only no stories. So meaning making by stories that we tell us that certain things, that's not so it, it's really shocking. And for me, it's I don't know, Elizabeth, how you see that for me, it's a ultimate deconstruction, <laughs> ultimate green wolf in, in, in what he is writing. So do you know, he's a big meditator. Yes, I know, but he is still saying the uh, the stories that they, they, they don't count in some way. You know, I don't understand that. But uh, I think I mean many many people meditate and never, and they do it in their own head. <laughs> <laughs> well, he medit Harari meditates every day two hours, so as, at least that's what he says, and he goes on retreats for months. I know. He does Goenka meditation. Yeah. Goenka Vipassana. Yeah. But I'm having, tr uh, I got very depressed when I read this book. And then I got back to my resilience and I decided, well, maybe the wow. female way is different. Mm. So, uh, but it's, still, it's, it, it's yeah. a good book. Yeah. I find it important to read things like that for really to, to find out what we want, what we, what our vision is and go through this nihilistic moment and think, is it really? Is it really? And even, you know, if I invent my story and my meaning, isn't it better than having none and seeing everything dissolved as relative and not really? So that was the reason why I invited you to, to talk about that. And I see when we are talking as women, we, we are just, you know, down to earth. We are just... I don't know how to say that. Well, I don't think all women. Let me introduce you to Lama Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> Bruno, uh, named after Frank Bruno. My, my ex-husband gave me Bruno for my 30th birthday. And, and he came into my first three-year retreat with me. And mm. when I came out of the three-year retreat and I went to a Buddhist center in Hamburg and they were saying, oh, Lama Hana, and please come and teach us and please guide all our meditations and you must be so wise and you must be almost enlightened because you, you've done a three-year retreat. I said, well, that doesn't mean anything. I'm not a Lama because I've not been empowered by my teacher and anyway, I, I don't have any realization. And they just, oh, and you're so humble as well. <laughs> so <laughs> finally I said, uh, this is Lama Bruno. I said, what do you mean this is Lama Bruno? I said, well, he was in the three-year retreat and he didn't miss a session. He was there the whole time. He didn't, he didn't throw a tantrum. He didn't have any uh, psychic breakdown. He was very kind. I mean, he consoled me so much when I was homesick or missed my husband. So, so if you want to respect somebody for having done, having sat for three years in a room, <laughs> in a room where nobody could see them, see what they're doing, then you respect him much more than me. <laughs> so they stopped calling me Lama after that. <laughs> so you refer this a little bit to the author of these books, maybe? Uh, well, uh, when you were just saying that, uh, that he's, he meditates, uh, but if he, on, it, well, if he meditates uh, Goyanka style and doesn't move beyond that, then... Uh, and then I can understand that uh, what he's, uh, I haven't read his books yet. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's very, uh, it's a very good path. I, I, I do recommend those retreats to, uh, to, mm -hmm. to students to really understand the, the first step of meditation. 
being able to concentrate and being able to accept and develop equanimity, but but uh, it doesn't allow for the mystery and uh, yeah, and the the, the 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 highest view in Buddhism is is uh, the Shantong view, where you you don't just see the emptiness of everything, but you see that emptiness and appearance are inseparable. And you see everything that appears, even suffering, uh, destruction, violence, you see as the play of illusion. And, and the, the understanding or even the recognition that everything is an illusion uh, makes it more real in a way. It makes, it, it makes you more able to understand that in that way, that everything is an illusion and therefore you're free. You're free to be loving. You're free to be creative. You're free. You can do anything. You know, and and why not then build a beautiful world? Um, we meditated on this yesterday, uh, um, on being not being, and we uh, finally found that we wouldn't call it an illusion, but a construct, construct of our mind. And people could get along with that much better. Yeah. Yeah, with illusion, I have a problem too because then. You <laughs> no, can it's not a problem, and... but a construct is yeah. a construct, and our mind is formed that way. It would, we, yeah. yeah. I this would. Like, I have to go, and I would like to follow that conversation thread again. So I think it's not like. <laughs> Next time, continue. Is life a, a illusion or something like this? Yeah, and maybe take <laughs> Harari's points as well, and and to to go on with that because there are so many things still not said yet. Yeah, yeah. And, I would say for today, we respect people's time. We we stop. We were all eight of us, and next time will even be Luna uh, with us. So if we are so many. It's a little bit restricted, but as in December, I was only with Monia. I thought we need <laughs> some more people <laughs> to be here, and I fear to be alone. And we had technical problems already. Right. So. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, and I will invite you, and we follow up with that. Is that okay with you? Good. And Gertrude, I see you tomorrow. And Victoria, we will set up your event, send me your stuff, okay? So, and thank you, Hannah, to be here, send you, Tammy, to be here. I will, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 B